हेलो डॉक्टर्स गुड इवनिंग दिस इज डॉक्टर हेरा सलमान सो लेट्स कंटिन्यू आर सेशन टू ऑफ नेफ्रोलॉजी स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम दिस टेस्ट फॉर एकेआई ऑफ एंटीरेटोलॉजी सो सी व्हेन द कॉज ऑफ एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी इज नॉट क्लियर द नेक्स्ट बेस्ट डायग्नोस्टिक स्टेप इज सो व्हेन वी आर नॉट क्लियर अबाउट द एटियोलॉजी ऑफ दिस एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी देन वी आर गोइंग टू गो फॉर दिस नेक्स्ट बेस्ट डायग्नोस्टिक स्टेप नेक्स्ट बेस्ट नॉट द बेस्ट नेशन नॉट द मोस्ट एक्यूरेट वन दीस आर द यूरिनालिसिस और यूरिन सोडियम फ्रैक्शनल एक्सक्रीशन ऑफ सोडियम एंड यूरिन ऑस्मोलैलिटी देयर consider to be the next best diagnostic step when the cause of AKI is not clear so tip for us is in all of these our choices always go with the urine analysis first of course of course first come first urine analysis urine sodium fractional excretion of sodium and urine osmolality so in all of these four we have urine analysis which is considered to be the first one now urine sodium and fractional excretion of sodium what do we mean by this decrease blood pressure or decrease intravascular volume normally will increase aldosterone whenever there is decrease blood pressure or decrease intravascular volume normally will increase aldosterone that's a natural process right the, how this renin angiotensin angiotensin system work whenever there is decrease pressure there will be release of aldosterone Why renin angiotensin system increase aldosterone increases sodium resorption. So whenever there is low blood pressure, this uh, renin angiotensin system activates it activates this uh, aldosterone. And what is the main function of aldosterone? It will increase sodium reabsorption. It means that more and more amount of sodium will be in the blood, and we are going to see hypernatremia. And because of that, blood pressure will rises. It is normal for urine sodium to decrease when there is decreased renal perfusion because aldosterone levels rise so whenever whenever there is rise in aldosterone level definitely serum sodium will be increased because of the reabsorption and urinary sodium will be decreased now in pre renal azotemia case there is low urinary sodium that is less than 20 which is equivalent to low fractional excretion of sodium which is less than 1% so whenever there is pre renal azotemia azotemia increase blood urea nitrogen level plus creatinine or if it's pre renal remember we have already done this pre renal post renal and intrinsic so in case of pre renal we are going to see low urinary sodium which is equivalent to low fractional excretion of sodium but low urinary sodium should be less than 20 and low fractional excretion sodium should be equal to less than 1% so less than 20 will be equal to less than 1% if it's a case of pre renal azotemia now urine sodium and fractional sodium give you the same information because they are equivalent so definitely they are going to give us a same information now tip for us is you can answer all the question on without knowing the mathematical formula of fractional excretion so don't go for the formula so we can uh, <laughs> you know easily answer the question related to these topic now urine osmolality osmolality when intravascular volume is low normally anti diuretic hormone levels should rise definitely when there is intravascular volume which is low this normally anti diuretic levels should rise because its function is to do the anti diuresis and maintain the amount of blood or maintain the amount of fluid inside the blood so that the intravascular volume can again increased now a healthy kidney will reabsorb more water to fill the vasculature and increase renal perfusion if the patient is normal and healthy definitely you know healthy kidney will reabsorb more water to fill the vasculature and increase renal perfusion okay azan is here just give me 2 minute please
all right so see urine osmolality it's when intravascular volume is low normally adh levels should rise because the main function of adh is to do the anti diuresis and increase the amount of blood volume so a healthy kidney will reabsorb more water to fill the vasculation and increase renal perfusion that's a function of the normal kidney now when more water is reabsorbed from the urine will the urine be more concentrated or diluted so definitely now it's are it, now they are asking us a question when more when more water is reabsorbed from the urine now will the urine be more concentrated or dilute increase water reabsorption leads to an increase in urine osmolality means more concentrated urine that's very important because increase water reabsorption it means that water are, water is going to be reabsorbed and less amount of water will be excreted so definitely urine will be concentrated in that case because most of them most of the water is reabsorbed so in in urine definitely the amount of water is reduced so urine will be concentrated and as a result there will be increase in urine osmolality now normal tube cells reabsorb water in atn in acute tubular necrosis the urine cannot be concentrated because the tubule cells are damaged so that is the main pathology in atn cases then in atn urine cannot be concentrated because the tubule cells are damaged so the urine produced in atn is similar in osmolality to the blood about 300 milli osmoles per liter so if the, if if you know there the urine is not concentrated so we are going to see the same osmolality which is in the blood that's the same osmolality we are going to see in urine that is 300 milli osmoles per liter so if it's a case when osmolality is same in blood and osmolality is same in urine that condition is known as isosthenuria now urine osmolality in atn is inappropriately low right in a case of atn patient urine osmolality is inappropriately low and isosthenuria is especially problematic when the patient is dehydrated so that is the main problem especially if if the patient is dehydrated now isosthenuria it means that osmolality which is same in the blood and same in the urine means the urine is the same means iso strength stenosis as the blood the term isosthenuria is used interchangeably with the phrase renal tubular concentrating defect so we can also use the word we can say isosthenuria that means the same osmolality in the blood and same in urine or we can also say it as renal tubular concentrating defect concentrating defect actually now dehydration should normally increase urine concentration whenever there is dehydration dehydration should normally increase urine concentration there will be more concentration of course if the patient is dehydrated it means that there will be more increase in osmolality if there is damage to the tubular cells from ischemia or because of toxin the kidney loses the ability to absorb sodium and water because of live functioning cell is necessary to absorb sodium and water as a result more and more amount of sodium and water will be lost in the urine and definitely we are going to see a diluted urine in case when there is atn acute tubular necrosis in atn the body inappropriately loses sodium which is more than above 20 and water which is having urine osmolality below 300 into the urine and that's why we are going to see diluted urine lots of amount of urine and which is also having low osmolality now healthy person with fluid overload it means that so whenever we say healthy person with fluid overload it means that low urine osmolality or the patient is having diluted urine that's why the patient is having fluid overload and as a result diluted diluted urine we are going to see in that patient if the patient is healthy person but with dehydration then there will be high osmolality and the patient must be having a concentrated urine that we are discussing about in healthy person in healthy person if it's a case of fluid overload more and more amount of you know uh, urine will be uh, more and more amount of water will be lost in urine as a result there will be diluted urine if it's a case of dehydration then definitely there will be concentrated urine now a 20 year old african american man comes from a screen uh, for a screening test for sickle cell he is found to be heterozygous trait or as for sickle cell what is the best advice for him so what we are going to advise to that patient if is asking for a screening test for sickle cell and he is found to be heterozygous and he is of african race and he is 20 years old 
so your best advice will be nothing needed until he has a painful crisis you have you will advise avoid for the void dehydration or hydroxyurea or folic acid supplementation or pneumococcal vaccination so what we are going to say to this person or this patient that we that he should avoid dehydration why the only significant manifestation of sickle cell trait is the defect in renal concentrating ability or isostenuria because he is a known case of sickle cell trait and that's only manifestation of sickle cell trait is that that there is defect in renal concentrating ability or we can say there is isostenuria defect in isostenuria so these patients will continue to produce inappropriately dilute and high volume urine despite dehydration the patient is dehydrated but despite of being dehydrated still the patient is you know coming with this high volume urine and there, there is inappropriately diluted urine so we can say there is defect so we'll ask this patient to avoid dehydration as much as possible hydroxyurea is used to prevent painful crisis when they occur more than four times a year then only you can go for the medical treatment with this hydroxyurea if the patient is you know why we want to give this hydroxyurea to prevent painful crisis if they are occurring in four times per year now painful crisis rarely occur in sickle cell trait they do not have hemolysis so there is no need for additional folic acid supplementation we are not going to see hemolysis in case of sickle cell crisis patients we are not going to advise for the folic acid actually we are excluding all the rest of the choices for this question is splenic function is abnormal only in those who are homozygous so pneumococcal vaccination is not a routinely indicated we are not going for the e option this pneumococcal vaccination why because the splenic function is abnormal only in those who are homozygous and he is heterozygous is already mentioned in the question right he is found to be heterozygous so if he is heterozygous we will not go for this pneumococcal vaccination we usually prefer this pneumococcal vaccination if it's a case of homozygous now we are coming towards classification of acute renal failure by laboratory testing so we have test we have this blood urea nitrogen creatinine ratio we have this urine sodium we have this fractional excretion of sodium and urine osmolality now what we are going to see in case of pre renal azotemia and what we are going to see in case of acute tubular necrosis if it's a case of pre renal azotemia and if it's a case of atn now if it's a case of pre renal azotemia this bun and creatinine ratio will be more than 20 is to 1 but in case of atn it will be less than 20 is to 1 we need to consider this ratio which is more in case of pre renal azotemia and less in case of atn now urine sodium will be less in case of pre renal azotemia but more in case of atn fractional excretion of sodium will be less than 1% in case of pre renal but more than 1% in case of atn and urine osmolality is the more in, in case of pre renal and less in case of atn and less than 300 which is as compared to the blood and pre renal azotemia more than 500 so in atn if you can say in atn only the urine sodium is more and fractional excretion of sodium is more other two things that is bun and creatinine ratio and osmolality will be decreased as compared to pre renal azotemia now point to ponder here is urine specific gravity correlates to urine osmolality if the patient is having high urine osmolality it definitely if someone is having high urine osm osmolality the specific gravity will also be raised so both of them are congruent if one is raised other will also raise so osmolality is equal to specific gravity high osmolality urine osmolality means high specific gravity now specific gravity on urinalysis correlated with urine osmolarity say for example now here we are discussing urine osmolarity specific gravity on urinalysis correlated with urine osmolarity so see we can all are interlinked with each other osmolality is equals to specific gravity and specific gravity is correlated with osmolarity so these are number of moles of solutes and that's the, for the solution for the solvent we here on uh, osmolarity and molarity we usually consider solute right that's just uh, physics if you remember and if we are oh, sorry chemistry so if we remember the osmolar uh, this molarity so molarity is actually for number of moles of solute right and molarity is number of moles of solvent so one is solvent and one is solute and that is actually molarity and molality so it's okay we just need to remember osmolality is equal to specific gravity and specific gravity will correlate with the osmolarity so all are interlinked with each other 
Now we can say when someone is having urine a specific gravity of 1 that equals to 100 osmolarity 1.030 it's 300 6.6060 it will be 600 osmolarity so that is correlated in this way. Now we are coming towards ATN, very important topic of nephrology, acute tubular necrosis is an injury to the kidneys from ischemia. So here the etiology is low blood supply and or toxin resulting in sloughing off of tubular cells into the urine. So actually the tubular cells are going to sloughed off because of toxins, because of low blood supply and they are coming into the urine. That's the main pathophysiology of this acute tubular necrosis. Sodium and water reabsorptive mechanisms are lost with the tubular cells. So here we are going to see that that reabsorptive mechanism is actually lost here. That sodium and water reabsorption. Protein urea is not significant since protein not tubule spills into the urine when glomerular are damaged. So protein urea is not significant since protein not tubules spills into the urine when glomerular are damaged. So definitely, so here why definitely we are going to see protein urea. Why? Because they are actually filtering from the glomerulus right not the tubules but we are going to see protein urea here now for the etiology knowing the causes of ATN is critical since there is no specific diagnostic test we should know the cause of ATN only on the basis of cause we can make a diagnosis or that to prove the etiology now you cannot do a blood level of a drug or a biopsy to prove that a particular toxin causes the renal function now you cannot do a blood level of a drug or biopsy to prove that a particular toxin causes a renal function. So here knowing the cause is critical because there is no specific diagnostic testing to prove the etiology. Now tip for us is acute renal failure and a toxin in the history are your clues to what is the most likely diagnosis question for the ATM. So acute renal failure and a toxin. So in history you need to evaluate whether it's a case of ARF or if it's related to toxin they are the clues for you. It, they will help you in making a most likely diagnosis and mostly this question for acute tubular necrosis. They are actually asking you for the diagnosis. They give you a scenario and you need to confirm the diagnosis. Now specific causes of ATM. Before going that, there is a question, a patient comes with fever and acute left lower cord and abdominal pain, blood cultures on admission grow E. coli and candida albicans. She started on vancomycin, metronidazole and gentamicin and vetericin. She has a CT scan that identifies diverticulitis. So on CT we have this diverticulitis. She's already started on vancomycin metro. Why? Because blood culture is showing E. coli gram negative cover and fungal infection is also there and patient is having fever and acute left lower quadrant abdominal pain left lower quadrant now which of the following see after 36 hours her creatinine rises dramatically after 36 hours creatinine levels rises which of the following is most likely the cause of a renal insufficiency why this creatinine is rising she is on vancomycin metrogenta and amphotericin she is having on blood culture E. coli and candida albicans. She is having fever and acute left lower quadrant pain. And 36 hours later, her creatinine is rising. So you are going to choose which of the following is most likely the cause of a renal insufficiency. Either because of vancomycin, she, un she undergoes into this renal insufficiency or gentamicin or contrast media or metronidazole or amphotericin. Here we need to see a CT scan is also done which is showing this diverticulitis. So here the rise of creatinine is because of use of contrast media for CT scanning. Radiographic contrast media has a very rapid onset of injury. Creatinine rises the next day. Here in 36 hours, vancomycin, gentamicin and amphotericin are all potentially nephrotoxic but they would not cause renal failure with just 2 or 3 doses. She just started with the medication. So definitely, these medications will take time to produce renal failure, right? Not with the start of the 2 or 3 doses. So we are not going to choose any medication. They need 5 to 10 days to result in nephrotoxicity. Maximum, you know, 10 days. Metronidazole is hepatically excreted and does not cause renal failure. So all of them are excluded only because she has undergone CT scan and in CT scan must be, you know, contrast media were used. So definitely the answer will be here is because of contrast media, the creatinine levels were raised. Now, a 74-year-old blind man is admitted with obstructive uropathy and chest pain. He has a history of hypertension and diabetes. His creatinine drops from 10 to 1.2. 
three days after catheter placement so before that there is 10 and after placing catheter the it's drop creatinine drops from 10 to 1.2 the stress test shows reversible ischemia now which is the most appropriate management still she is in reversible ischemia and she is is a case of obstructive uropathy and she's having chest pain and she's known case of hypertension and diabetes and after placing catheter her creatinine levels drops from 10 to 1.2 now what is the most appropriate management most appropriate management for this case for this 74 year old woman that's coronary sorry man coronary artery calcium score and ct scan are you going to do one or two liters of normal saline hydration prior and during angiography and acetylcysteine prior to angiography mantol during angiography or furosemide during angiography or intravenous sodium bicarbonate before and during angiography so what is the most appropriate management as her creatinine drops from 10 uh, his creatinine drops from 10 to 1.2 so here your most appropriate management will be 1 to 2 liters of normal saline hydration prior and during angiography why because saline hydration has the most proven benefit at preventing contrast induced nephrotoxicity in angiography when you use the contrast so definitely that can cause nephrotoxicity and in order to prevent that nephrotoxicity in this patient you are already going to give him this 1 to 2 liters of normal saline that is actually going to prevent the nephrotoxicity which is which is because of contrast we will we will use a mannitol and furosemide may or may not prevent nephrotoxicity there is minimal data to support their use and acetylcysteine we don't have data and sodium bicarbonate have some benefit but the evidence is not as clear as that with saline Calcium scoring on CT scan is still considered experimental. So whatever the thing which is not clear yet, we are not going to choose it. And it does not provide sufficient information to eliminate angiography. So here we just need to remember that this patient, for this patient, we need to choose what is the most appropriate management. So for the management point of view, in order to prevent nephrotoxicity in this patient, we can we, we have to give this 2 liters of normal slime prior to and during angiography as well. Now, how to answer questions correctly when your real life experiences disagrees with what you read here? The last question may distress those of you who regularly see your attendings use N acetylcysteine and bicarbonate to prevent renal failure from contrast. So, in routine practices, we, can, we usually give this N acetylcysteine and bicarbonate to prevent renal failure from contrast. But this is a case in which a person with no clinical experience in the area will do better than a person regularly in the hospital. They are using these substances because the risk of precipitating worse renal failure is very real when using contrast. Contrast enhanced procedures are often unavoidable and these are generally benign substances. We have nothing else to offer beyond hydration. So for the bookish point of view, for the theory point of view, we have to choose hydration option. But in routine practices, we usually give an acetylcysteine, we usually give bicarbonate to prevent renal failure. But don't choose answer on the basis of clinical practices. We will go for the theory, bookish knowledge, right? So that is hydration. Now, a patient with mild renal insufficiency undergoes angiography and develops a 2 mg per deciliter rise in creatinine from ATN despite the use of saline hydration before and after the procedure. See, she has already, this patient has already received saline hydration. Despite of receiving hydration, his or her uh, creatinine develops a 2 mg rise in creatinine from ATN despite use of saline hydration. So, what do you expect to find on lab testing? So what will be the lab testing result in this patient if despite of using IV fluid the patient is still having rise in creatinine. So here what do you expect to find a laboratory testing this urine sodium low and fraction more than 1 and urine specific gravity of 1.35 means high specific gravity or low specific gravity or low low sodium and low fractional sodium. So here your correct answer is urine sodium which is very low very low and fractional sodium which is less than one person and specific gravity very high so in that case this should be the result if your patient's creatinine rises it means that the urine sodium is very low in that case fractional excretion of sodium is less than one percent in that case and definitely the patient must be having very high specific gravity that's why the you know the this blood urine hydrogen creatinine level is rising 2 milligram raises there. 
of this creatinine. Although contrast-induced renal failure is a form of ATN, the urinary lab values are an exception from the other forms of ATN. Contrast causes a spasm of the phrenatriol that leads to renal tubular dysfunction. Now, this is the pathophysiology. Why this contrast media is nephrotoxic? Why? Because this contrast media, whatever the contrast media we are using in angiography, that can cause a spasm of the afferent arteriole that leads to renal tubular dysfunction so this is all about the contrast media which actually leads to renal tubular dysfunction there is tremendous reabsorption of sodium and water leading the specific gravity of the urine to become very high there is tremendous reabsorption of sodium and water see more tremendous reabsorption of sodium and water leading the specific gravity of the urine to become very high very concentrated urine you are going to see in these patients because more and more amount of sodium and water is reabsorbed and this result in profoundly low urine sodium so definitely if more and more amount of sodium is absorbed reabsorbed in the blood definitely in urine you are going to see less amount or low urine sodium the usual finding in atm from nephrotoxin would be urinalysis urine sodium that is above 20 and fractional sodium that's greater than one percent but a lower specific gravity and a specific gravity correlates with urine osmolality and here the osmolality is, is here you can see the osmolality is high in a case if there is concentrated urine but osmolality is low if it's a diluted urine and here we are going to see very concentrated urine why because more and more amount of sodium and water is reabsorbed and less amount of you know sodium we are going to see in urine now a patient with extremely severe myeloma with a plasma cytoma is admitted for combined chemotherapy two days later the creatinine rises so in this case the patient has undergone this combination chemotherapy and after the use of this chemotherapy two days later the creatinine rises what is the most likely diagnosis so definitely here we can say cisplatin or hyperuricemia or benz jones protein or hypercalcemia or hyperoxaluria here what is the most likely cause of this uh, because this patient is having extreme severe myeloma and plasma cytoma is also there is admitted for combination chemotherapy now here the answer is hyperuricemia why because two days after chemotherapy the creatinine rises in a person with a hematologic malignancy so whenever there is hematologic malignancy we can see the rise in creatinine after the use of this chemotherapy and this is most likely from tumor lysis syndrome leading to hyperuricemia so when you administer chemotherapeutic drugs it means that that is going to do the tumor lysis syndrome in that patient and because of the tumor lysis syndrome we are going to see hyperuricemia because more and more amount of protein is more uh, protein lysis will be there and there will be more amount of uric acid production in blood more uric acid will be there and hyperuricemia will be noticed now cisplatin as with most drug toxicities would not produce a rise in creatinine for 5 to 10 days and here the creatinine rises just two days later so cisplastin is not the correct answer here why because cisplastin actually needs five to ten days for getting the rise in creatinine benz jones protein and hypercalcemia both cause renal insufficiency but it would not be rapid and would not happen as a result of treatment that can also cause but not because of the treatment and, and not in so much like acute condition treatment of myeloma would end up by decreasing end up decreasing both the calcium and benz jones protein level because they are produced from the leukemic cells so treatment for myeloma would end up decreasing now if we are uh, opting for the treatment option for the treatment when we are treating our patient that's a myeloma patient so we will see that treatment would end up decreasing both the calcium and benz jones protein so if we are treating for the myeloma so definitely we are going to see low calcium at the end and low benz protein levels because they are produced from the leukemic cells so when we actually killing the leukemic cell with the help of this chemotherapeutic drug so we will see the low amount of calcium and low amount of benz jones protein cancer cells do not release oxalate so there is no point of a hyperoxaluria that's the e option here so we will never find this hyperoxaluria in these patients why because oxalate does do not really cancer cells do not release oxalate 
Now, what would have prevented this event? So, what should we use in that case in order to prevent this hyperuricemia? We can use allopurinol, we can use hydration and raspberry case should be given prior to chemotherapy to prevent renal failure from tumor lysis. And we know very well that we are going for the treatment of our tumor patient uh, that is mostly hematological tumors like multiple myeloma patient and we are going to use uh, this chemotherapeutic agent. So, we should have this in our mind that patient must be presenting with this hyperuricemia there will be kidney renal failure functions or renal failure thing will be there because of this hyperuricemia because because of the tumor lysis syndrome we are using chemotherapeutic agent so it's far better to use directly or you know prevent your patient from all these events directly by giving prior to chemotherapy before even starting chemotherapy you put your patient on allopurinol or you hydrate your patient and do respir give respiratory case should be given prior to chemotherapy to prevent renal failure it's all about the prevention from this renal failure and why because of the tumor lysis syndrome and why because tumor lysis, tumor lysis syndrome we are going to observe in that case in which there is hematological malignancy like multiple myeloma patient or any hematological problem the way we are going to use chemotherapy and because of the use of chemotherapy there will be rise in uh, uric acid and that can cause renal dysfunction so it's far better to use to prevent your patient prior before stopping putting the patient on chemotherapy. Now, a patient who is suicidal ingest an unknown substance and develop renal failure three days later, her calcium level is also low and the urinalysis shows an abnormality. So, a patient who is suicidal ingest an unknown substance, we don't know the substance and the patient develops renal failure three days later, her calcium level is also low and the urinalysis shows an abnormality, what did she take? Now, in your opinion, what was the poison? Aspirin, acetaminophen, ethylene glycol, ibuprofen, opiates, and methanol. So, here is ethylene glycol. Why? Because ethylene glycol is associated with acute kidney injury based on oxalic acid and oxalate precipitating within the kidney tubules causing acute tubular necrosis. So, acute tubular necrosis, ATN. Here we can say that why we are choosing this ethylene glycol because it is associated, firstly it is associated with acute kidney injury based on oxalic acid and oxalate precipitating within the kidney tubules causing ATN. So here the cause of ATN is oxalic acid or oxalate precipitation because her calcium level is low. Right, her calcium level is low and the urinalysis shows an abnormality. Which is what abnormality that's not mentioned here. But we are going for this ethylene glycol. Why? Because we are considering here that oxalic acid or oxalate precipitations that can cause kidney damage, which can lead to ATN. An oxalate crystal appears as envelope shaped crystals. Now, these are the pathognomic features of this oxalate crystals. They are they are occurring just like envelope shaped crystals. The calcium is low because it precipitates as calcium oxalate. So they will use calcium for the precipitation point of view. So calcium will be decreased in blood. Aspirin is renal toxic but does not lower calcium. So why we haven't choose this aspirin as the correct answer? Although aspirin is renal toxic but it does not lower calcium level and has no abnormality in urinalysis. Why we are not opting for the acetaminophen? Because acetaminophen is hepatotoxic. Ibuprofen and all answers are renal toxic by constricting the afferent arteriole and causing allergic interstitial nephritis and papillary necrosis. They have no impact on calcium levels and the only time something would be found in the urine is in the case of papillary necrosis. So either we will, we, uh, acetaminophen is purely hepatotoxic. It's not nephrotoxic at all. So just exclude it. Why we are not choosing this ibuprofen and ANSYS? Because they have nothing in direct relation to keeping the calcium low. They are not associated with this decreased calcium level. They have no impact on calcium levels and the only time something would be found in the urine is in the case of papillary necrosis. Only in the case of papillary necrosis we can say. But papillary necrosis cause sudden flank pain and fever. Methyl and uh, this methanol Methanol causes inflammation of the retina and has no renal toxicity. So, a methanol option is also here, F option, but we are not going to choose for it. Why? Because methanol is not associated with renal toxicity. It is associated with retinal inflammation. 
Opiates by injection are associated with focal segmental glomerulonephritis, not acute kidney injury. So this E option opioids, that's we are, we are not going to choose it. Why? Because we have to memorize this thing that this uh, opioids that can cause glomerulonephritis. And what type? This focal segmental glomerulonephritis. It it does not cause AKI, that is acute kidney injury. In addition, that is only with the impurities found with injection drug use, certainly not opiate medications. So here the correct answer is ethylene glycol. Why? Because ethylene glycol is associated with acute kidney injury based on oxalic acid and oxalate, which is going to precipitate and precipitate it and in the form of calcium oxide. So it will utilize more and more calcium. So as a result, amount of calcium will be decreased in the blood. That's the most important point here. Now we are coming towards toxins producing acute tubular necrosis. Now toxins have an increased likelihood of developing acute tubular necrosis toxins that can cause ATN if there is hypoperfusion. Toxin is there and because of hypoperfusion we are going to see acute tubular necrosis. If there is underlying renal insufficiency such as from hypertension or diabetes, if the patient is hypertensive, if the patient is diabetic, ischemia is there, toxic toxin is there that can lead to acute tubular necrosis. Now the risk of acute tubular necrosis is directly proportional to increasing age of the patient more the more the age the more will be atn the body loses one percent of renal function for every year past the age of 40 so above 40 the body loses one percent of renal function for every one year that's an important point to ponder here all right now summary of causes of acute tubular necrosis now if you're going to summarize it the non-oligouric renal injury is caused by aminoglycosides antibiotics amphotericin cisplatin vancomycin acyclovir cyclosporine these are all the medications and they are responsible to cause non-oligouric renal injury slower onset they all are very slow in onset usually 5 to 10 will take 5 to 10 days so in acute cases never choose these any of the medication as answer to cause this acute tubular necrosis dose dependent the more administered the sicker the patient gets low magnesium level may increase risk of aminoglycoside or cisplatin toxicity if the patient is having low magnesium level that may increase the risk of aminoglycoside or cisplatin toxicity so low magnesium level is related with increased risk of these toxicity contrast media cause immediate renal toxicity so whenever there is acute something goes wrong always think of this ct scan or mri which we use contrast media that can lead to immediate renal toxicity this can best be prevented with saline hydration so it's always better to hydrate your patient n acetylcysteine and sodium bicarb are not consistently proven as beneficial although in routine practice clinical based practices we use this but for the bookage point of view for the theory point of view we are just only going to choose hydration option yes then we have this hemoglobin and myoglobin that rhabdomyolysis that's important thing we are going to see here hyperuricemia from tumor lysis syndrome acutely long-standing hyperuricemia from gout can cause chronic renal failure so this this gout if it's chronic one that can also lead to crf and hyperuricemia because of the tumor lysis syndrome may, may majority of cases because of you know hematological malignancies there we can see hyperuricemia that can lead to acute tubular necrosis then we have this precipitation of calcium oxalate in the renal cortex from ethylene glycol overdose the question just we did ben jones protein is directly toxic to renal tubules in case of multiple myeloma patient like a history of use of ansets so that can also lead to acute tubular necrosis so these are all the important etiologies we should memorize it now rhabdomyolysis rhabdomyolysis is caused by trauma prolonged immobility snake bite seizures and crush injury so these are all the causes of rhabdomyolysis in which the skeletal muscles is going to uh, you know lysis of the skeletal muscle will be there and that is just because of trauma because of immobility prolonged immobility because of the snake bite because of the seizures because of the crush injuries the best initial test to confirm the diagnosis is urinalysis we'll go for the urinalysis the urinalysis will be positive only on dipstick for large amounts of blood 
but no cells will be seen on microscopic examination so we are going to see red blood cells large amount on especially positive on dipstick but not visible under microscope now these are the rhabdomyolysis etiologies etiologies that can lead to rhabdomyolysis like cocaine that constrict vessels and it can cause rhabdomyolysis low potassium low phosphate statins viral infections these are all the thing that can lead to rhabdomyolysis even use of statins also the risk is only 0.1 percent but that is there viral infections low phosphate low potassium cocaine use and this low potassium and cocaine both act in the same way both constrict vessels and that can cause rhabdomyolysis but low potassium low phosphate uh, it causes actually break cell and that's why hyperuricemia will be there and crf will be there can lead to uh, you know renal injuries now urine dipstick cannot tell the difference between if we are going to choose this urine dipstick urine dipstick cannot tell the difference between hemoglobin and myoglobin or rbc's only blood is will be positive there but we don't know that positive thing is because of hemoglobin because of myoglobin because of rbc's then we have this creatine phosphokinase cpk levels are markedly elevated in case of atn but it is findings on urinalysis that tell you myoglobin is spilling into the urine so if there is myoglobin spillage that you can always confirm with the help of the cpk because that uh, that thing dipstick will never give you a clue that this is myoglobin this is because of a red blood cell or this is because of hemoglobin so you can always check with the cpk level if cpk level is rise it means that myoglobin is there myoglobin is the cause the most specific test is a urine test for myoglobin hyperkalemia occurs from the release of potassium from dema cell because 95 percent of the potassium in the body is intracellular so hyperkalemia occurs from the release of potassium if there are damaged cells we are going to see more amount of potassium in the uh, in the uh, more amount of potassium in the blood and that is hyperkalemia hyperkalemia because of damaged cells hyperuricemia occurs from the same reason it does in tumor lysis syndrome most likely uh, this metallurgical tumors when cells break down nucleic acids are released from the cells nuclei and rapidly metabolized into uric acid and that's why the amount of uric acid is raised and we are going to see hyperuricemia so that hyperuricemia can lead to renal injury now damaged muscle release phosphate damaged muscle if the muscle is damaged that is going to release phosphate and hypercalcemia occurs from increased calcium binding to damaged muscles why we are seeing hypercalcemia in this case because from increased calcium binding to damaged muscle whatever the muscle is damaged that has uh, you know greater affinity for this calcium and that calcium will bind to that uh, damaged muscle and that's why the free calcium in the blood is decreased and we will say the calcium is low in the blood so that term is known as hypocalcemia why doesn't hemolysis cause hyperuricemia rbc's have no nuclei that's very simple why with the why if the rbc's are hemolyzed we are not going to see hyperuricemia because there is no nucleus if there is nucleus there are proteins and because of the lysis of that you are going to see uric acid uric acid is the end product of metabolism so if there is no nucleus so definitely there will be no uric acid in term of rbc's if you are saying now you have to treat a patient with saline hydration if it's a case of acute tubular necrosis you're going to give saline hydration and mannitol as an osmotic diuretic because of the here we see concentrated urine so before the osmotic diuresis we can give this mannitol and we are going to give saline hydration the concept is that myoglobin is a severe oxidant stress on the tubular cells saline and mannitol increase urine flow rates to decrease the amount of contact time between the myoglobin and the tubular cells see the concept is that myoglobin is a severe oxidant stress who is the severe oxidant stress myoglobin where on the tubular cells and saline and mannitol increase urine flow rates to decrease the amount of contact time between the myoglobin and the tubular cell because if there is more contact time between myoglobin and tubular cell the we will see that because myoglobin is a 
severe oxidant stress it's going to give a stress to the tubular cells and tubular cells are going to damage more and more and more so our duty is to hydrate patient more and to give mannitol to our patients so that they will be flushing of this uh, uh, myoglobin flushing of this myoglobin so that's that can lead to decreased contact of time to the, the of this myoglobin to the uh, to the tubular cells and as a result our tubular cells will be saved so don't treat hypercalcemia and rhabdomyolysis if patient is asymptomatic in recovery the calcium will come back out of the muscle so definitely the precipitation is there now the binding is there because calcium is mostly binded to the traumatic damaged cells or traumatic muscle cells right so once there once if you uh, uh, if the patient is asymptomatic right in recovery the calcium will come back so no need for to give you know, no need to treat this hypercalcemia because once the patient is recovered the damage is you know repaired then definitely the whole calcium will come back so no need to treat hypocalcemia in these patients all right we just uh, do this last question and we have to do the uh, whatsapp recall session now, a man comes to the emergency department after a triathlon followed by status epilepticus he takes him with statin at triple the recommended dose his muscles are tender and the urine is dark intravenous fluids are started what is the next best step in the management of this patient see the emergency department after a triathlon followed by status epilepticus so status epilepticus patient in emergency department and he already on statins at triple recommended dose his muscles are at are tender and the urine is dark urine is dark muscles are tender iv fluids are started what is the next best step in the management of this patient your patient followed by status epilepticus so what you're going to do either you're going to check cpk level or you will do ecg potassium replacement urine dipstick or urine myoglobin here your patient is in emergency department followed by status epilepticus here you are going to do ecg why that's the next best step in the management of this patient why because ekg is done to detect life threatening hyperkalemia so definitely if you are going to go for this ekg or ecg you will rule out this hyperkalemia and your question may have potassium level as the answer cpk level urine dipstick for blood and myoglobin should all be done but they are not time dependent but the ekg will see if he is about to die of a fetal arrhythmia so you have to do ecg because we need to rule out because of this you know life threatening if a hyperkalemia is there that can lead to arrhythmia and patient can die because of arrhythmia so we need to check this first and ekg will see if he's about to die of fetal arrhythmia from hyperkalemia and potassium replacement a person with rhabdomyolysis would be fetal so we can go for the potassium replacement also now treatment there is no therapy proven to benefit acute tubular necrosis patient should be managed with hydration you just need to give hydration if their volume depleted correction of electrolyte abnormality is diuresis increase urine output but do not change overall outcome we can use diuretic that actually increases the urine output but overall it cannot change the overall outcome more urine output with diuretic does not mean renal function is reversing so more urine output with diuretic does not mean you have to treat the cause right just by giving diuretic it doesn't mean that the renal failure is going to be reversed we need to treat the cause as well Tiferous answering treatment question for ATN is based on recognizing the most common wrong answer low dose dopamine diuretics mannitol steroid all of these are ineffective in reversing atn if you're thinking that by giving dopamine or by giving diuretics or by giving mannitol or by giving steroids we can reverse the atn so this is not the case why because this low dose dopamine diuretics mannitol steroids they are not effective in reversing atn what is it what is uh, effective in reversing atn one thing one and first and foremost is hydration that's your more most important goal so correct the underlying cause in atn that would be the best answer you need to correct the cause underlying cause rather treating the symptoms all right so i'm just going to stop here tomorrow we are going to continue from this dialysis dancer thank you